Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss in this final part of this lecture is independence itself, a deleted violation, the writing of the Constitution, what James Madison thinks about government, and a whiskey rebellion. There's the outline right up above me, and let's go ahead and proceed. And all of this is in service of the question right up above. Why have a government? There's that question. You've heard it before. You should have written it down, and it should be bubbling away in the back of your brain. You already have most of the pieces to solve this puzzle, and I'm just going to give you the last few right here. Where last we left off, uh, Common Sense had been published, and the Committee of Five had been formed to write the Declaration of Independence. Now, there's got five members, and they're all founding fathers, and I hate to give any of them short shrift, but there's only three that you really need to pay attention to here. And those three are, right up above me, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson rocking that, rocking that purple coat, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Benjamin Franklin on the left, and of course in the middle is John Adams. And all three of them write the Declaration of Independence, although Thomas Jefferson writes most of it. In fact, Thomas Jefferson writes the original draft of the Declaration of Independence. If you actually analyze the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Independence has three sections to it. The introduction, which gives the reason uh, that the colonies are declaring their independence. Then it follows 28 violations that list the abuses of King George III. And it lists the 28 times that King George has violated the 1689 English Bill of Rights. And then finally, there's the statement of separation at the bottom, the conclusion. There we go. It's a perfectly structured essay. And in the final section, the, se the statement of separation, it basically states that the social bond between the British government and the American colonies is hereby dissolved. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the statement of separation, but we are going to focus on the introduction, a little bit on the violations and then discuss the missing violation. Here is, of course, the very famous introduction to the Declaration of Independence, almost purely written by Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson is heavily, heavily influenced by one of our three political philosophers that we discussed earlier. Let's go ahead and actually read the text of it. <clears throat> I have to do Mr. Jefferson justice. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of that people to alter or abolish it, to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Okay, so here we have God, and God gives you these natural rights, and it is the purpose of the government to defend these natural rights. Life, liberty, and, well, Jefferson says pursuit of happiness, but we've heard those words before. In fact, we've heard them from one of these cats right up above me, right up above my, my little yellow box. So, who had the most influence on the Declaration, especially its introduction? Hobbes, Locke, or Montesquieu? And write your answer in your notes. Now, uh, the second section of the Declaration of Independence lists the 28 violations of King George III. And here's, here's just like a few of them I've picked out right up above me. Um, I don't, I'm not really going to focus on any of these. Some of them are, are kind of very narrow and legalistic. This is a document written by lawyers, after all. You know, uh, and it's, it's mostly dealing with violations of the English Bill of Rights, refusing to pass laws, raising taxes by royal prerogative, 
um, refusing to sign laws, for, you know, limiting the democracy present in the American colonies, restricting the power of colonial government. We're not really going to deal with any of those. What I really want to focus on is not any of the 28 violations that are listed in the Declaration. I want to focus on what's not listed in the Declaration. Thomas Jefferson, in his original draft of the Declaration, lists, well, he doesn't list 28 violations. He lists 29. But the rest of the Committee of Five, and especially Benjamin Franklin, raise strong objections to the 29th violation, and it is removed from the Declaration of Independence. This is the 29th violation, the deleted violation that Thomas Jefferson wanted to put in the Declaration. And there it is. I'll read it. He, the he is King George. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. Thomas Jefferson wants to call out slavery in the Declaration of Independence. He wants to accuse King George of helping build American slavery. He calls American slavery contrary to human nature. It violates sacred rights of life and liberty. This is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson owns like 200 slaves. This is Thomas Jefferson who puts this in there. Franklin will not have any of it. The other, the rest of the Committee of Five uh, back, back Franklin on this. Franklin wants it out. Jefferson backs down. The violation condemning slavery in the Declaration of Independence is removed. Is Franklin a racist? Fra frankly, no, he's not. Uh, in fact, he's, I mean, he's from, I mean, he's, he's not a Quaker himself, but he's from, you know, Quaker people. He grew up around Quakers, and they were the original abolitionists. So Franklin's reasoning in removing this violation that condemns uh, slavery has to do with the fact that he wants as many colonies as he can to sign. And Franklin's objection is that if we condemn slavery in the Declaration, the Southern colonies, especially South Carolina, will not sign the document. And that is... Franklin's goal, to get as many people to sign the Declaration as possible. Jefferson backs down, and the clause condemning slavery in the Middle Passage is removed from the Declaration. Now let's talk about slavery again. Let's, let's return to this subject. Um, you know, the great moral sin of early America. Um, We've already talked about why the early abolitionists objected to slavery. They said it was unchristian. You know, the selling of Joseph and the Germantown petition. But these guys that were that are writing the Declaration, these guys in the in the uh, generation of the Revolution, these guys are deists. They're not really into evangelical religion. They believe in kind of you know the clockmaker God. So the question is, where are they getting this? Where is Jefferson getting this objection to slavery to? And the answer is that he's getting this from Enlightenment political philosophy. So I want you to cogitate this for a second. And I want you to come up with an answer to this question. Specifically, in terms of Enlightenment political philosophy, in terms of those cats over there on the left, you know, Locke, Montesquieu specifically, why is slavery wrong? Why is slavery morally wrong? according to Enlightenment political philosophy. And I want you to maybe pause the video if you need to, cogitate on this, and write down your answer in your notes. Why do you think John Locke or Baron Montesquieu would have opposed the ownership of their fellow human beings? Take your time. I'm, I'm just here in this yellow box. I'm not going anywhere. That's terrible.
Got it? Good. Let's go. The Committee of Five finishes the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, in Franklin's very famous words, gentlemen, now we must hang together or we will all hang separately. And they signed the Declaration of Independence at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And above me, we have this very, very famous painting of the Declaration of Independence. And that, um, that, that scene never happened. It's, it's complete, it's complete mythologizing. Uh, none of those people were ever in the room together. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is in a great scene in the old HBO John Adams series. He, he complains about this painting. Uh, the above scene never happened. What happens with the Declaration of Independence is, is that people are moving in and out of Philadelphia. You know, there's a British army over in New York, which is continually threatening Philadelphia. In fact, it takes Philadelphia at one point. People are scurrying in and out of uh in and out of uh, Independence Hall all spring and summer long. They're not, they don't sign it at the same time. There is never a formal, like, sit down where everyone lines up and just signs it one after the other. It never happens. It's signed in a very piecemeal fashion. Some of the delegates come down from Boston, sign quickly, and then go back to Boston. The southern states come up, sign quickly, and go. Some very nervous New Yorkers uh, come down from New York, sign, and then return to New York. Um, but still, this is a painting with all of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, oh, and, and of course, very famous John Hancock, the guy who was funding the Sons of Liberty up in Boston. Uh, he hears that George III is hard of, uh, has to wear spectacles. He's hard of, uh, he doesn't have, doesn't have very good uh, eyesight. So that's why John Hancock signs his name really big, to make sure that King George can see it. That's, that's kind of how radical John Hancock is. Uh, but here, here's a painting with all of the signers of the Declaration in the same room, which, of course, never happened. Uh, but that's okay. It's, it's mythologizing. It's, 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 it's creating a foundational myth. But we still can't pick some people out. Uh, you know, there's Jefferson up there. Jefferson's the ginger. Uh, the older fellow, that's, of course, Benjamin Franklin. The stout, bald fellow is, of course, John Adams. And you can pick them out. Uh, and they sign the Declaration. And once the Declaration is signed, boom, there is no going back. You are either, America is either gonna win its independence or be brutally crushed by the British. And here's the map of the Revolutionary War. You know, there's fighting up by Boston. There's heavy battles in and around uh, New York between Philadelphia and New York. There's the carnage going, going on in the Southern colonies. You know, Benjamin, you know, Benjamin Lincoln surrenders into his entire army. There's the battles of Saratoga and Cowpens and Kings Mountain. And I'm not really going to cover the revolution itself. We already did that uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the political ideas that are rotating around the revolutionary time and about the formation of the government. So the revolution happens and the revolution comes to a conclusion. Of course, major military action ends in October uh, 19th of 1781 with the surrender of the last big British army on American soil. And that is, of course, the army of Lord Cornwallis up above me at the Siege of Yorktown when the British army is trapped between the combined American-French armies and the French fleet, which is just off the coast. Uh, the British fleet wasn't there probably because their, their Lord Admiral was busy having a sandwich. At any rate, uh, the painting up above me never happened either. Uh, Lord Cornwallis did not surrender in person to George Washington. He declared he was too sick uh, and sent an aide instead. And uh, the junior officer had to do the, the task of surrendering to Washington. And Cornwallis surrenders and is sent back to England. Uh, and the really funny thing about Lord Cornwallis is he actually goes on to have a pretty distinguished military career after the revolution. He goes on to rule India. And there's actually statues of him in India. He's a pretty good ruler in India. At any rate, uh, major military action ends in 1781. Um, negotiations over the final end of the war drag on for another year and a half. And America is finally declared independent in the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And that's it. The war is over. America won. Everybody gets a bald eagle. Everybody gets a drum and a flag. And it's, it's just nothing but wine and roses uh, from 1783. Just everything is just great. Everybody just goes back to their farm 
and everything is just just absolutely wonderful and there's never any problems ever in America again. No, the country was a total wreck. Um, at, even though it had won the Revolutionary War, uh, I mean, after after six years of heavy fighting, the country is just wrecked, all right? The country is absolutely wrecked. Uh, everything is disabled. Towns have been burned. Cities have been bombarded. Some towns have been erased from the landscape. People have been killed left and right. The country is in total meltdown. And to make things even worse, uh, the country goes through a major collapse of currency in the 1780s. Right after George Washington uh, wins his victory at Yorktown, he can't actually pay any of his soldiers. Um, and uh, the entire currency of the United States falls apart. Uh, the Continental Congress is basically just printing dollars, but the dollars are completely worthless. And uh, the American dollars become so worthless that the individual states start to print their own currency. And if you look over there on the lower left, that's a dollar from the 1780s, but that's a Maryland dollar. That's a, that's a, that's a dollar that's only good in the state of Maryland. And uh, in lieu of hard currency, the entire economy melts down. And one of the reasons there is no hard currency is to win the revolution, America had to borrow a lot of money from overseas, from the French, from the Dutch, from the Spanish. And those countries wanted to be paid back, but they insisted they didn't want to be paid back in worthless American dollars. They wanted to be paid back in hard specie, in gold and silver. So America's got to scrape up all the gold and silver and send it overseas. And there's almost no currency in the United States itself. So you have these situations over and over where these soldiers are hanging around in the army. They haven't been paid in months. Eventually they give up, go back to their you know, blacksmith shops or their farms to find that their farm has been completely abandoned, it's overrun. And the bank that holds the farm loan will only accept hard currency uh, for loan payments. And there's no way to get money to pay your loans. Local tax collectors will only accept valid dollars, Maryland dollars or Massachusetts dollars, or even there's some banks start to issue their own currency. And you have this situation where, you know, soldiers return to their farms or soldiers return to their shops in towns only to find that they're not being paid and that the tax collectors are foreclosing on their shops or foreclosing on their farms the, the officials of the country they fought to create are taking their assets. The country is in total collapse. Out in the countryside, you know, these armed bands of farmers start to form. These guys are, after all, almost all soldiers with military experience. Um, they call themselves regulators, and basically they start wandering the backwoods and wandering these sort of farm districts, attacking tax collectors, attacking banks coll bank collectors, attacking, you know, collection agencies. Uh, the country is in really, really bad shape. And this boils over into a, a large-scale rebellion in Western Massachusetts, led by a guy called Daniel Shea. Daniel Shea was a captain in Washington's army. In fact, he was, he was a war hero. He'd been given, actually, a, a special sword uh, by the Marquis de Lafayette, by this French officer that was like encrusted with silver and gold and it was this big fancy sword. Uh, but, but Daniel Shea leaves the army. He goes back to Massachusetts. I mean, the guy was a hero at Bunker Hill. He goes back to Massachusetts, uh, finds that he can't collect his army pay because the, the government doesn't have the money to pay him. Uh, what little money he can scrape up is worthless paper currency he goes back to his farm to find his farm is on the verge of being seized by a bank in Boston, which will only accept gold or silver payment. And Daniel Shea, Daniel Shea has to sell his ornamental sword given to him by France in order to make minimal payments on the banks that he owes in, uh, in Boston. And there's a lot of discontent in Western Massachusetts. Uh, people are very upset at tax collectors. People are very upset at these banks. And uh, the banks in Boston are showing absolutely no sympathy, absolutely no patience. They are foreclosing on farms. They are foreclosing on businesses. If you cannot pay your loan, I don't care if you're a war hero, 
you lose your farm. And there is a lot of discontent. Reg bands of armed farmers, these regulators, are out in the countryside. And some of these old veterans, some, I shouldn't even say old, the war was on, you know, the Revolutionary War only ended like four years ago, uh, in, you know, in the context of Shays' Rebellion. And major fighting only ended five years before Shays' Rebellion. So they go to Daniel Shea. He's a captain. He's used to commanding men. And they go, tell us what to do, Captain Shea. And Daniel Shea is like, all right, this is what we're going to do. And he organizes these local regulators into, you know, as you can see on the left, a rough and ready militia. They begin marching on local banks. They begin marching on tax collectors. They march on tax officials. They burn down banks. They attack and beat up tax officials. Now, Daniel Shea... Daniel Shea is not super aggressive. He isn't this sort of wild-eyed revolutionary. He makes sure he, he makes sure nobody gets killed. He makes sure that there's minimal destruction, but he wants his point to be made. The veterans are owed something. Farmers are owed some kind of relief. The current structure and the current economic meltdown is unacceptable. And the cruelty of these banks in Boston is unacceptable. Western Massachusetts is in a state of rebellion. The governor of Massachusetts asks the government, it's the revolutionary government under the Articles of Confederation. He asks the government for help. The Articles of Confederation can lend no help whatsoever. They're broke as well, uh, and they have no money, and they have no ability to pay soldiers at all. The governor of Massachusetts eventually turns to the banks in Boston, the only people with any money. And the banks in Boston proceed to make an agreement. They will pay for a private bank army as long as the governor uh, deputizes them as the Massachusetts militia, and then they will go crush Shea's rebellion. And that's exactly what happens. The banks in Boston essentially hire a private army and they hire them by basically picking up all of these revolutionary soldiers that, you know, haven't been paid by the government, but the bank bank's money is good. And they build this bank army. They give it to the governor. They give it to the state of Massachusetts who marches out West and crushes Shays rebellion. It is a, a brutal act of complete and utter tyranny. And the rest of the States are completely horrified at what goes on with Daniel Shea's rebellion. And this goes back to our question about political violence. You should actually have an answer to this question in your notes. Is political violence legitimate? And when is political violence legitimate? What makes political violence legitimate? Was Daniel Shea justified in his uprising against the state of Massachusetts? Did he have legitimate complaints? And did he have a point? I mean, Daniel Shea himself uh, is never captured. He actually flees to the West. He escapes Massachusetts. And I think he ends up in Ohio. Um, but yeah, the, the crushing of Shea's rebellion is, is seen as this really awful thing. And here's a hard fact of the world. Here's a hard fact of political philosophy. And it basically goes like this. Um, most democracies fail. Democracies are these very fragile institutions and they can very easily fall apart. And the history of the world is filled with many, many examples of failed democracies. And it's not even, you know, it's not even like 51% of all democracies fail. The vast majority of democracies fall apart. Even the great democracies of the classic world you know, the great democracy of Athens, that failed. You know, they launched this ridiculous war against Sparta and they lost. I mean, Athens was defeated by Sparta. The Athenian democracy fell apart. You know, the Republic of Rome, you know, people standing around in togas and giving these great speeches. The Republic of Rome failed. Uh, it was taken over by senators wielding armies and factional fighting and resulted resulted in, you know, one of the senators declaring himself emperor. Uh, most democracies fail. And, you know, if you read the news or you pay attention to what's going on overseas, one of the things you'll realize is that we, we, 
we as Americans get kind of haughty sometimes. We're like, oh, you know, we tried to establish democracy in, you know, this Middle Eastern nation, and oh, it they screwed things up and it fell apart and it ended up in a military dictatorship. And we're sort of like, ah, those people. But we shouldn't we shouldn't be so arrogant. Uh, we shouldn't be so haughty. Democracies are very hard things to build. They're very easy things to destroy. And most democracies failed. And in the early days of the American Republic, in the years following the Revolutionary War, American democracy was on the verge of failure. And we know this. We know this because George Washington writes about it. Because something happens somewhere in the mid-1780s, maybe 86, 87, we don't really know. We know it happened because George Washington mentions it in a letter. But what seems to have happened is something like this. Now, I've taken this image from Assassin's Creed, uh, which is a, it's a, pretty, a pretty cool video game uh, that has this sort of alternative history. Because in the mid-1780s, the whole country is so screwed up. You've got unpaid soldiers. You have regulators wandering the countryside. You have Daniel Shea raising a rebellion in Western Massachusetts. That... George Washington is approached by a group of his old soldiers. Now, this wasn't unusual. George Washington, oh, after the war, he resigns his commission. He goes back to his plantation at Mount Vernon and basically kind of struggles to make it work. And the country is so screwed up that even George Washington is having problems, even breaking even on his farm. It's a big farm, but he's having trouble breaking even on it. And it was known that any, any of his old Revolutionary War buddies could always stop by his house at Mount Vernon and they could have dinner with the old general. Uh, and he would, you know, he would give you, he would feed you and give you a nice uh, glass or two of Madeira wine. So uh, Washington was known to host, host guests, especially he liked hanging out with his old war buddies. And in the mid 1780s, apparently George Washington is approached by a group of soldiers. And, and these are these are not like salty old veterans or, or, you know, like grumpy privates. These are colonels. These are brigadier generals. These are people of status, wealth, and power. And basically, they have a private meeting with George Washington. And they say, General, General Washington, I mean, the country is wrecked. And, and Washington is like, yeah, the country's in really bad shape. It's, it's, it's really wrecked. Uh, and they say, General somebody's got to do something. And General Washington says, well, what, what do you mean? What are you talking about? They offer Washington the old army. They say, General, call the army back. March on Philadelphia. Arrest the government. Declare yourself the dictator of the United States. Fix your country. The army will back you on this. They offer George Washington total power. And he could have taken it. So when you read about these countries in Latin America or these countries in Africa or these countries in the Middle East that are really struggling with their dictatorships, that are really struggling with democracies, struggling in resisting dictatorships, uh, and when they fall to military strongmen and one general seizes power and then another general seizes power. And we, we shouldn't be so arrogant in, in laughing this off and saying, those countries. Because that almost, that almost happened in the United States. Almost happened. All George Washington would have had to do, all he had, would have had to do is just nod his head and he would have become the dictator of the United States. Washington said no. Well, George Washington turned down the opportunity to wield total unchallenged power in the United States. He said no. And we know this because you know, in a letter, he actually mentions this. He mentions that he will not act against the government in any way. He will not call the army back and he will resist any efforts to do so. 
George Washington shuts down any attempt to seize power, uh, given the chaos of the, the United States during the Articles of Confederation. But also George Washington knows something that most people don't. George Washington knows that plans are being made to replace the government. Because George Washington has a very good friend. And George Washington's very good friend is a young man named Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton has been talking with two of his friends, James Madison and John Jay. John Jay is over there on the left. Because Madison, uh, Hamilton, and Jay are going to propose a set of radical reforms to the government. And they start writing a series of articles, a series of essays, agitating for a radically new government in the United States, for a federal government. And the, these papers these, they write, these essays they write, are known as the Federalist Papers. And they are uh, the fourth of the founding documents. Fourth? Yeah, four, five, six. Okay, they are the fourth of the founding documents that we'll talk about uh, in this lecture. The Federalist Papers, uh, 85 essays published between uh, 1787 and 1788. So what are the Federalist Papers? The Federalist Papers are 85 essays, and they don't even have titles. They're just given names. Uh, the Federalist Papers are, you know, just like Federalist number one, Federalist number two, Federalist number 10. They're just numbered. And the Federalist Essays... Uh, one, numbered 1 through 85, detail the political philosophy behind this attempt to create a radical new government. And they argue that we need to create a strong central government organized around the principle of federalism. Federalism is a theory of government that holds that uh, a country needs a strong government, but a strong government with power divided between equal portions of the government. So you have power divided between the different parts of of the central government and between the central government and the state governments. And the federalism, that's why they're called the Federalist Papers. And that's why the people supporting these ideas become known as the Federalists. Most of the Federalist Papers are written by Alexander Hamilton. Um, although at the time they were all published anonymously. And the importance of the Federalist Papers is the Federalist Papers are the theoretical foundation for the constitution that is about to be written. And if you want to know what any particular part of the Constitution means, if you want to look at, say, you know, what did, the, what did the founders mean when they drafted the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, you go read Federalist Number 29, and Madison and Hamilton will tell you exactly what they meant when they wrote this Constitution, when they wrote that part of the Constitution. The Federalist Papers are basically the study notes, it's the study guide for the Constitution that's going to follow. And there's 85 of these essays. Some of them are more important than others. Probably the most important Federalist essay is Federalist number 10. Uh, but I've listed just a few of the important Federalist papers to the left. There's Federalist number one, which basically argues that the existing government under the uh, Articles of the Confederation, the old Revolutionary War government, is insufficient and must be replaced. And it must be replaced with a radically new form of government. Then there's, of course, the, the probably the most famous uh, Federalist essay, which is Federalist Number 10, which argues that the best type of government is a republic, that a republic is the best way to defend the natural rights of its citizens, the God-given natural rights of its citizens. That's the point of government, and a republic is the best way to do that. But there's a bunch of other ones. Federalist Number 13 argues, uh, it makes the economic cause. It says a Central government would be able would be more economically sound with a unified economic policy, and it would do better uh, than each state having its own economic policy. And Federalist 13 argues that a strong central government organized around federal principles can fix the economy. It can fix the problem with currency. Uh, apropos to our current era, you could go read Federalist number 29. Federalist number 29 talks about the militia. And it basically says, Hamilton writes, firearm ownership is necessary for the defense of the nation and for each individual to defend their natural rights of life, liberty, and property. So I mean, there's, there's no debate over what Federalist 29 means. Anyway, so then we get to Federalist 39, 
And Federalist uh, 39 basically says that a good government is necessarily a divided government, that the best type of governments have are, are elected governments, they are elected republics, and the different sections of the government are pitted against each other. So it's a divided government. In that way, a government can never become despotic because it has to share power with equal proportions of itself. Those are the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers uh, generate this movement to create a new government. And it becomes increasingly obvious that the existing Articles of the Confederation are not working. And this comes together into a series of conventions throughout 1787. And it culminates in the Philadelphia Convention, which is held uh, through the summer of 1787, from May to September. Uh, and that, that painting actually took place. That is a painting of the Constitutional Convention. They bring together all of those old revolutionaries. They bring together as many of the signers of the Declaration as they can find. They're not all around. Uh, some of the some of the people of the dec uh, some of the people who signed the Declaration and some of those early revolutionaries are long gone. Um, Thomas Paine isn't there, for instance. Thomas Paine goes off to France to go help with, with the French Revolution, and he shows up and he says, "I'm here to help you with the French Revolution." And then the French put him in jail for a year and almost execute him. At any rate, uh, the Philadelphia Convention is where they basically write the U.S. Constitution. And all of those people are there. You can actually pick out some of the people in the painting. There's George Washington is invited to be the president of the Philadelphia Convention. He doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to get in, involved in politics, but he's good friends with Hamilton, and Hamilton says, this is how you fix the country. Uh, and Washington reluctantly agrees and shows up and is elected president of the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, there's Jefferson... Uh, there's there's Adams over there. There's no oh, the little guy is Madison, and the old fellow in the center, that's a very aged Benjamin Franklin, who's so old and sick by this time he actually has to be carried in. Uh, he just 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 have just have him put him in a chair. People just carry the chair in and out of the convention hall, and it's held in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And uh, over the course of the summer, they work out a series of rough compromises that will become the United States Constitution. And primarily the chief author of the Constitution is James Madison. And they sit there all summer long, and the Constitution is, is a very clunky document. It has a lot of ugly compromises that they have to make between big states and little states, between rich states and poor states, between states without states that are free and states that have slavery, and be exactly how elections are going to work. And it all gets worked out very, very slowly and very painfully over this summer uh, of 1787. And eventually, on September 14th, 1787, they reach consensus on a document and James Madison formally writes that document down. And that is the United States Constitution, the same Constitution we have today. And it's very hot. I mean, they're in this, I mean, it's of course, before air conditioning, the room is very, very hot. Uh, and, and right at the end, Benjamin Franklin is actually on the verge of passing out because he's, you know, he's, he's not a young guy anymore. And as they are carrying him out of the chamber, uh, people are outside Independence Hall and they like want to know what this new government is going to look like. And they see poor, tired, exhausted Benjamin Franklin being carried in his chair out of the out of the uh, out of the uh, Independence Hall. And they basically say, what, what did you guys make? What, what shape is it? What shape is it? What did you make? And Benjamin Franklin's very famous reply is uh, we made a republic if you can keep it. And that quote by Franklin kind of echoes more than 220 years later, 240 years later, that, that democracies are fragile things and they require work uh, and they shouldn't be taken for granted. And we only have our republic for as long as we can keep it. And then then is actually this, this really funny thing happens. After they formally agree to the, con to the Constitution, they all leave Independence Hall. They all file out the side. And then they all walk four blocks down the street to a bar called the City Tavern. And then they all proceed to have this huge party. 
And uh, we know this because one of the, the primary documents that has survived is the bar tab from that night where, you know, I mean, it's so weird to think, you know, George Washington you know, collects everybody and literally walks four blocks, takes them to a bar. Uh, and then basically proceeds to use the government money to buy, to buy everyone drinks. Uh, it's so weird to think, you know, George Washington sitting at a table, like, ordering bottles of wine. And over the course of the night, these, like, 40 or so delegates that show up to this bar uh, consume uh, somewhere around 150 bottles of wine, whiskey, and beer. So uh, they ended the Constitution in this, like, big party at the city tavern. Uh, and the bar doesn't exist. Independence Hall is still there. You can still visit Independence Hall. But if you go to Philadelphia, they, the city tavern itself burned down, but they built apparently a pretty good, reg, a pretty good replica. And you could actually go to the city tavern where uh, George Washington bought, you know, 150 bottles of wine for everybody. Now, uh, James Madison is the author of most of the U.S. Constitution. And James Madison... Uh, takes a very kind of mechanical view of government. And this is what James Madison says, and, and everyone agrees with James Madison, that basically we cannot concentrate power in any single branch of government because government, this should sound familiar, a unified government will necessarily become tyrannical. It will necessarily become despotic. Therefore, James Madison argues, what we should do is create a government that is structurally divided. And the organization that James Madison selects is to separate the legislative branch from the executive branch from the judicial branch. And all three parts of government are co-equal and neither has any power over the other. And they all exist in a system of checks and balances. The legislative is Congress. Congress passes laws. But to become law, it has to be signed by the president. And then the judicial branch gets to decide whether if the law is constitutional or not. Uh, the individual congressmen are elected, but the president doesn't come from Congress. The president is elected separately. And to become a member of the judiciary, the president appoints nominees to the judicial courts, the federal courts into the Supreme Court, but it has to be agreed on by Congress. So every branch of government is co-equal. And this creates one of the great frustrations of being an American voter, of being an American citizen, which is why is our government so slow and ineffective? Why can any kind of random politician, any kind of random senator or congressman who just doesn't like how things are going can basically stop an entire process? And the answer is that that's that's by design. Uh, James Madison built the government exactly like that. That any one part of the government could basically jam the entire system if they want to. Every, to work, just like that little, like those gears on the lower left. For the government to do anything, everyone has to agree. Or everyone has to be, has to reach some sort of agreement. I always make the analogy that the American government is designed like a bus uh, where the president is the driver, but every seat has, a, has access to the brakes. Uh, the brakes are at every seat. And if one person on that bus doesn't like where the bus is going, they can hit the brakes. And that bus doesn't move until everyone agrees. The slowness and ineffectualness of the U.S. government is built in by design. And it's built that way to prevent the government from becoming tyrannical, to prevent one person from seizing power in multiple branches of government. And James Madison writes the Constitution. Uh, he's the author of most of the Constitution. And the Constitution has a, a, a series of problems. It's not a perfect document. It is a series of awkward compromises. And some of the problems they had with the Constitution, they just kind of threw up their hands and said, we'll figure it out later. Uh, and eventually they did. And, and in the early years of the United States and in the early years of the Constitution, they do have to constantly kind of fiddle with these little aspects of the Constitution, like exactly like how a vice president becomes president when the president dies, exactly how you elect a president and a vice president. That changes a couple times. Uh, senators used to not be elected at all. 
Senators used to be appointed by the individual states. Only congressmen were elected. Uh, but a lot of those things get worked out very slowly and painfully over time. But James Madison, when he does write the Constitution, writes explicitly why government exists. He lists six reasons why we have a government. And I want you to go back to your notes from the very first lecture and compare your reason to James Madison's reasons. And these are the six reasons that James Madison gives as to why we have a government. One, to form a more perfect union. Two, to establish justice. Three, to ensure domestic tranquility. That means not Shays' rebellion. Four, to provide for the common defense. Five, to promote the general welfare. That's, that means fix the economy. And then finally, six, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. This is why James Madison says we have a government. Why do we have a government? Those are the six reasons James Madison gives. And if you are, if you have a lot of, if you already have reasons or close approximation of these reasons in your notes, congratulations, you're you're right up there with James Madison. You know, and he was a president. Now, this idea of divided government to prevent government from becoming tyrannical, that should sound awfully familiar. So, which one of these these three political philosophers had a great deal of influence on the Constitution? Is it Hobbes? Locke or Montesquieu, you should know that. It should be really evident. Now, the uh, Federalists fan out across the country with copies of the new Constitution. And for the new Constitution to go into effect, it has to be agreed on by all the states. It has to be agreed on by a majority of states. And on the left is the percentage of each state for or against uh, the Constitution. And the Federalists, especially with the backing of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, the Federalists have a very, very logical argument to support the new government. And the group of people that organized to oppose the new constitution, they're people called, they call themselves the Anti-Federalists. And the Anti-Federalists argue it gives too much power to the central government. They argue it doesn't give local states enough power. But the Anti-Federalists have a losing argument because to argue against the Constitution is to argue in favor of the old failed revolutionary government, the old Articles of Confederation, which are manifest failures. So the Federalists win the day and the first state to uh, acknowledge the new Constitution is Delaware, which is why they call themselves the first state. And the Constitution goes into effect. And it has been the law of the land for, you know, 240-odd years. But they're not done. We're going to address the last of our six founding documents, and that is the Bill of Rights. To get the Federalist, to get the Federalist Constitution passed, a lot of states demand that, certain, that the certain rights be added to uh, the Constitution. Now, Alexander Hamilton actually opposes this. Alexander Hamilton opposes the Bill of Rights. He argues that these should be left up to individual states. And he has a point. Uh, but Madison does not. Madison says, if this is what it takes to make create the new government, then this is what we'll do. So the states say you have to add a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is an interesting document because the Bill of Rights, because the Federalists didn't really want to add it in, it was added in to sort of convince reluctant states to sign onto the Constitution. The Bill of Rights doesn't actually give the federal government any powers. The Bill of Rights doesn't guarantee you any rights. This is what a lot of people get wrong about the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights does not give you freedom of speech. What the Bill of Rights do is it says the government cannot interfere in your freedom of speech that you already possess. The Bill of Rights basically says that these rights are natural rights. They are the, the free rights and the liberty given to you by your creator. Capital C, creator. You, you already have these things. The right of assembly, the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom to bear arms 
the freedom to prevent soldiers from being quartered in your home, the freedom for unreasonable uh, uh, seizure, the right to a jury. You already have these things. And the Bill of Rights merely says the government can't abridge the rights you already possess. Uh, the Bill of Rights does not grant any rights. It merely states what the federal government cannot do. It sets the physical boundaries of the social contract. You already have freedom of speech. The First Amendment does not give you freedom of speech. The First Amendment merely says the federal government cannot abridge your freedom of speech. A lot of people get that wrong. The, the, the Constitution doesn't give you any rights. It merely says the government cannot change the rights that you were given by, by that person. Which of these political philosophies is most manifest? Which one of these guys talked all about natural rights given to you by God? Is it Hobbes? Is it Locke? Or is it Montesquieu? It should be really apparent which one, which one it is. Now, I talked about that the Constitution is not a perfect document. The Constitution has a series, uh, it's got a lot of little wonky flaws in it that get worked out throughout the 1790s and into the 1800s. It is a series of compromises. That's what the Constitution is. But it has one glaring error in it. It has one huge, massive hole in it, and that is it utterly and completely fails to address the problem of slavery. In fact, slavery is not even mentioned in the original Constitution at all. And... The issue of slavery threatens to derail the entire Constitution itself. Uh, and, it, and it has to work out with exactly how you count these American slaves. Um, the southern states want the slaves to be counted as full citizens, yet they don't want the slaves to be given the rights of full citizens. So they want slaves to be counted for purposes of a representation, but they don't want slaves to have the right to vote. This, of course, outrages the northern uh, states, which say this is this makes absolutely no sense. If you're going to count these American slaves as citizens, then you have to give them the rights of citizens. But the problem is, as the southern southern states uh, respond, the problem is if you give them the rights of states, the rights of citizens, then the Bill of Rights comes into effect, and you can't be a citizen and a slave at the same time because there's the Bill of Rights right there. So they work out the three-fifths compromise. And the three-fifths compromise is right up above me. The three-fifths compromise basically said, well, just I'll just read it. It says that representatives in direct taxes shall be apportioned from the several states which shall be included in this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole person, the whole number of free persons, including those that are bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. So that lays out who is a citizen. Citizens are free persons. Indentured servants are citizens. Indians who pay taxes are citizens. And then three-fifths of all other persons? Those are the American slaves. The three-fifths compromise makes no goddamn legal sense whatsoever. You, how can you be three-fifths of a citizen? You're, 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 you're a citizen, but you're not protected by the laws that govern citizens? It, it makes, and why three-fifths? Why not three-fourths? or one half, it is this awkward, weird compromise. It makes no sense. It leaves no one happy at all. The northern states are not happy with the three-fifths compromise because it gives the southern slave owners some power, and it also it makes no legal sense whatsoever. The southern states are not happy with the three-fifths compromise because they want their slaves to count as full citizens for, in, you know, to represent them. That way they get more congressmen and more senators. Well, they get more congressmen. Um, and the three-fifths compromise kind of leaves 
a foul taste in everybody's mouth. Nobody likes the three-fifths compromise. And the three-fifths compromise is the major flaw in the new constitution. And it is recognized as such at the time. People are like, this is going to be a huge problem. But people say, it's fine. Let it go. We'll fix it later. It is fixed later. Um, but of course, after the events of a brutal and bloody uh, civil war. So the three-fifths compromise is one of the contributing factors to the civil war. The new constitution is passed. They hold a presidential election. Surprising absolutely no one, George Washington is elected president. Almost unanimously. I don't even think he, anyone runs against him. George Washington is elected president. He is president from 1789 to 1797. And one of the first things that happens during his first presidency is a rebellion. A rebellion just like Shays' Rebellion in Western Massachusetts, except this is the Whiskey Rebellion and it takes place in Western Pennsylvania. And what happens with the Whiskey Rebellion is basically this. Uh, George Washington becomes president. He appoints Alexander Hamilton to be Secretary of the Treasury. And Alexander Hamilton is this incredibly gifted financial officer. He proceeds to fix the American economy and he's doing a really good job of it and paying off these debts that America owes from the revolution. And one of, one of Alexander Hamilton's ideas, one of his ways to raise taxes is to place a tax on whiskey. And he does, they place a tax on whiskey. No one actually thinks about what the consequences of the whiskey tax will be. And the result is the consequences of the whiskey, whiskey tax are an armed uprising in Western Pennsylvania. Now the farmers in Western Pennsylvania grew rye and barley and wheat. Uh, but the roads in Pennsylvania were usually so bad, it was cost prohibitive to basically fill up 10 wagons full of wheat and barley and rye and move it to Philadelphia or move it to Pittsburgh to be sold. It was much easier to take, to sell what you could to the local markets, take your excess rye and barley and wheat and turn it into whiskey. All right. And therefore, instead of 10 wagons of wheat, you've got one wagon of whiskey. And the profit margin on whiskey is much, much higher than it is on regular, you know, subsistence crops. And whiskey is also something that takes a lot of time to make a really good whiskey. It's got to sit in your barn for a couple years. So what Alexander Hamilton did when he passed the whiskey tax is he took the profit margin that these farmers were making in Western Pennsylvania, and he basically wipes out their profit margin. Suddenly, these farmers who had just started to break even after the chaos you know, of the post-revolutionary period finally see their livelihoods completely wiped out by tax collectors. And again, a lot of these guys are old Revolutionary War soldiers. They know how to fight. They've been in battles. And they start to rise up just like they did in Western Massachusetts. And you can see the painting there up on the upper left. Uh, they've got their blue coats from the Revolutionary War. They gather up into armed bands. They start abusing and chasing tax collectors. They start burning down houses. They start burning down post offices. They threaten to march and burn Pittsburgh down. This is a major uprising. And it's, it's one of the first major challenges faced by the new nation and by the new president, George Washington. And this is what George Washington does. George Washington summons the Virginia militia. He summons the Pennsylvania militia and he unites the two in an army of about 15,000 men. And he starts very slowly moving this army westward. And as he's very slowly moving this army westwards, in fact, this is, uh, I think, the only time in American history in which a sitting president has taken an active military command. As he is very, very slowly and deliberately slowly moving this army into Western Pennsylvania, um, he sends out representatives and he says, look, you guys are old soldiers and we know you're upset. We know you're really bothered by this whiskey tax, which is ruining your farms. Uh, the, the president knows the problems. The president is willing to meet with you. And a lot of these guys are, gen are Washington's old soldiers and they respect him, you know, because they fought together back in the revolution. And they don't think he's actually going to meet with them. They say, well, Joe, the president is not going to meet with us whiskey farmers in Western Pennsylvania. 
but Washington does. Washington rides out way in advance of his own army and voluntarily starts to meet with the Whiskey Rebels. And he listens to their problems. He listens to their complaints. He agrees, we're going to fix the whiskey tax. We're going to fix the whiskey tax. But all of this burning and mayhem, that has all got to stop. You can't threaten to burn Pittsburgh down anymore. That's why I've brought this army. And, and you know, on the lower left, there's General Washington leading the army towards the Whiskey Rebellion. And he says, I don't want to use that army, but I will. And George Washington talks the Whiskey Rebellion into voluntarily breaking apart. It is, it is an extraordinary act of personal charisma and uh, complete bravery. Because they could have killed him. And the Whiskey Rebellion breaks apart. And George Washington says, well, I'm still going to arrest some people. And you're going to be put on trial for treason because you rose up against the government. And the leaders of the Whiskey Rebellion are tried. They are arrested. They are tried. They are found guilty of treason. And they are given the death sentence. And then Washington gives them a presidential pardon. George Washington ends the Whiskey Rebellion with no loss of life. All right. He disbands the army. He goes back to the capital in Philadelphia because there's no Washington, D.C. The difference between the, the end of the Whiskey Rebellion and the end of Shays Rebellion could not be starker. This is how the new American president is going to handle things. Calmly, rationally, and in a democratic and fair way. And this is the character of George Washington. You now have all the pieces you need to answer this question up above me. Why have a government? We talked about the three big political thinkers of the, of the 18th and 17th centuries. We talked about the six main documents of the American founding, all the way from the English Bill of Rights to the American Bill of Rights. And you should be able to draw lines between which political philosopher added to which document in the American founding. And you should know what parts they don't follow and what parts they do. And that is going to be on the test. And you'll see this question again in the future. And that brings us to the conclusion of why have a government. In the well, you'll see what we're doing in the next section. You'll see. And I will see you there.